Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our virtually speaking series. Uh, tonight, uh, we're joined by a very distinguished Latimerian, Professor Sir Jim Smith, class of 1973. Uh, and Jim is currently the Interim Director of Research Programs at Wellcome and a visiting group leader at the Francis Crick Institute. His illustrious career has included key roles at the Wellcome Trust, Cancer Research UK, Gurdon Institute and the Medical Research Council. He's a fellow of the Royal Society, fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences, and a member of the Academia Europea. He has been awarded prestigious awards, uh, including the EMBO Medal and the Waddington Medal. And in 2017, Jim was quite rightly knighted in the Queen's New Year's Honours list. Uh, a globally recognised developmental biologist, Jim always makes time for his old school uh, and previously uh, served as a governor, chairing our education committee. Um, and this summer, uh, for my sins, I attempted to keep up with Jim as we cycled 102 miles uh, in aid of the bursaries appeal. And that's just another example of how Jim continues to give back to his old school. Before we hear from him, I wanted very briefly to tell you a little bit about uh, our virtually speaking series. Uh, we launched this program of online talks over the summer as a way of bringing the Latimer community together in the absence of our usual social events. Uh, indeed, on Friday evening, uh, Jim and his friends and I were together for the annual Latimerian dinner, which again, uh, for the first time, took place virtually uh, to great acclaim. This has really taken off, uh, and it's an impressive showcase of our community, teachers, alumni, parents, uh, and I'm really pleased to say that to date, it's raised more than £12,500 for our bursary program as part of our Inspiring Minds campaign. Many of you kindly made a donation when registering for this evening, and I'm pleased to say that well over £200 has been raised, and this will go to provide bursaries for young people joining Latimer next year. Thank you for your contributions. Finally, a couple of house rules for this evening's talk. Uh, everyone will be on mute, so you can all hear Jim clearly. Do please feel free to type questions in the chat facility so that Jim can review and answer as many as time allows at the end of his talk. So it just remains for me uh, really to give somebody an introduction who needs no introduction, um, but, but I spend a lot of my life doing that. Uh, Jim, over to you. Thank you, David. And thank you all for listening to me this evening. It's great to see so many old friends and, and I hope some, some new friends. Um, what I want to tell you about is, um, is some science actually, and I want to try to um, explain to you the subject that I've been interested in and working on for most of my scientific life. Um, and I want to describe it in terms of three stages in my scientific career, from when I began as a PhD student, from the middle of my career, and now. So, so I'm going to take you through some 40 something years of science with some vignettes of my work that I hope will illustrate what I think is it's the most important problem and interesting problem that you know we have in life and that's about how we came to be now i'm going to show you some slides um i'm not going to be like you know chris witty next slide please i'm going to do the slides myself um but i will switch back you know to myself occasionally as well so that you know i'm here here as well as the slides so the first slide let me make sure i can share screens which i think i am able to do and can you tell me, well, um, let's see who's, who's in the screen. If you can see on the left-hand side, uh, an orange egg, would you put your hand up, Taylor? I can see you. Good man, okay. So the question is how we came to be. And I hope that I don't um, begin to introduce too much science too quickly, but I think we all know that everybody in this virtual room began from a single cell, the fertilized egg, and that fertilized egg divided and divided and divided, and eventually made human beings. And these are the human beings that were drawn on the side of the pioneer mission that was sent off into space. And the question I'm interested in is how did that single cell divide? How did it make all those cells? Importantly, how does the right kind of cell form in the right place? What I mean by that, for example, is that um, if you look at your eye, I'll take my glasses off, you, the lens of your eye is right in front of the retina. Your hands are right at the end of your arms. Your arms are both the same length. 
I could add that there's no cell, no constituent cell in your arm that is different from the cells in your leg, but you can tell the arm from the leg because the cells are arranged in a particular way. And what I'm particularly interested in is how cells in the body come to be arranged in a particular way. So that's the question. It's a big question, and that's illustrated by the numbers that I'm about to show you. So one cell, that one cell becomes 40 trillion cells, four times 10 to the 13. There are in the body 200 different types of cell. There are skin cells, muscle cells, heart, heart muscle cells, um, kidney cells, uh, lung cells, you name it. There's 200 different kinds of cells. And the, and the challenge is to see how all those cells fit in the right place. Just to give you a sense of the, the magnitude, I'm going to tell you one other thing. Cells are the fundamental building blocks of the human body, indeed of anybody, and they contain within them a nucleus, and within the nucleus is the DNA that tells the body what it's going to become. Oh, that was a that was a that was something I meant to say and forgot, but uh, well, I said it, but I didn't put a slide up. So, each of the cells in your body has a nucleus containing uh, a length of DNA. Actually, it turns out that seventy percent of the cells in your body are red blood cells and have no nucleus. But what that means is that with two meters of DNA per cell, we have enough DNA in our bodies. If you take out the DNA in each cell, stretch it out, that DNA will stretch to the sun and back 80 times. So this is a number that if nothing else, tell your kids, win some money, how much DNA have you got in your body? It is enough to stretch to the sun and back 80 times. So it's a gargantuan task to understand this process. Just to illustrate the number of cells again, if each cell were a marble, one and a half centimeters across, then that's a conventional you know, container that you see on a ship. You'd need 1,400,000 of those containers to contain all the cells in the human body, and they would fit onto 70 of what is the largest you know, container ship in the world. So all those marbles, 200 different colors, arrange them into a human being. That's, that's the challenge, and it's a tricky one, I argue. So first of all, then, it's an interesting problem. How does it work? The second thing is that it's also um, medically very important as well. And I just think about health for a moment. 15% of couples have difficulty having a child. 23% of human conceptions are lost in the first five months. And 2% of children are born with a major genetic defect. And the more we understand human development, the better off we are with respect to solving these problems. And with respect to number one, 15% um, of couples have difficulty having a baby. The, the middle image you see at the bottom there is my twin daughter in utero. The, the right hand one you see at the bottom is her twin brother, born um, 18 years ago through in vitro fertilization. So this work not only is fascinating, I think, in its own right, but it's also very important for improving human health. So that's why it's interesting and that's why it's important. How do we understand the process? Well, one thing you can do, of course, is you can work on human embryos and ask how, how they develop. Clearly, this is, a, this is not an easy thing. Um, there are, there are difficulties obtaining embryos, and of course, their ethics, of course, as well. But um, licenses have been issued, particularly to people in the lab I work in at the, at the Crick. And here's an example of one experiment that you can do with human embryos. And what you see here on the left-hand side is a um, fertilized human egg. And I'm just going to run a little movie, and you'll see that egg as it begins to divide. So two cells, four cells, and so on. And what you'll see as that embryo continues to divide is that it forms um, a hole in the middle, a sort of cavity in the middle. 
And at the bottom of that cavity, you'll see a small group of cells. There, there it is at the bottom there at about seven o'clock. That small group of cells is called the inner cell mass. And it's those cells from which every cell in the human embryo in the human being will eventually derive. What Kathy did, my colleague Kathy Nyken, was to be able to inhibit the function of one gene, just a single gene in the human embryo and ask what happens. And what she found is that, again, there's the embryo, you can see it dividing. And what you'll see in a few moments is that that, that division becomes disrupted, that cavitation doesn't occur properly and things begin to go seriously awry. So this is an example where we have a gene, we think it's involved in these early stages, and we can work out what it's for and what it does. But clearly, you know, we can't use human embryos to understand human development because of the material and importantly, of course, the ethics. So what do we do? The answer is we can work on other species. And it turns out that embryonic development is astonishingly well conserved from species to species. And I'm going to give you one example in this slide here. Now, this is probably the scientifically most complicated slide I'm going to show you. At the top on the left, you can see a fruit fly. At the bottom on the left, you can see um, a mouse embryo at about 15 days after fertilization. And what you see returning to the top, I don't know if you can see my pointer, this is a chromosome along which genes are arrayed. And there are genes with peculiar names, and I'll come on to the naming of genes soon, um, arrayed along this chromosome in a particular order. And it turns out that those genes are turned on in the animal from the head to the tail. So that orange gene called labial is expressed in the mouth. The red gene called Zen in the back of the head. The blue gene called Antenopedia, this ancestral gene here, that's expressed in the front part of the abdomen. So those genes in the fly, expressed along a chrome, uh, positioned along a chromosome, expressed in, in, the, in the fly in the same order. Well, it turns out it's exactly the same in the mouse and human embryos. And I'm not going to take you through that um, box by box, but you can see through half closed eyes that it's exactly the same, that these genes are expressed along the chromosome in the same order. They're expressed in the embryo in the same place, and they are required for the development of those particular parts of the body. So if there's another message for you to take home, it is that actually you are at home, but the, the, the mechanisms of development are highly conserved from fly to mouse and human. And that means that we can use embryos of all sorts of species to understand human development. And that's, I think, the next important message. So which species should we use? And I've listed, well, not listed, but shown you photographs of the different species that we've used in the course of our work. That's a fruit fly in the top left. That's zebrafish in the middle at the top. On the right hand side at the top is the um, South African claw toed frog, Xenopus levis. Chicken, bottom left, mouse, and a worm at the bottom right called Cena rhabditis elegans. And having given you an introduction and kept well to time, I'm now going to tell you about my PhD work, which was focused on the chicken embryo. So let's go to the chick. And what I'm going to tell you about is this question that I was alluding to earlier on about how do the right structures form in the right place. I'm pointing at my fingers because that's what we're going to look at. And I'm going to tell you the answer before describing the problem. And a common way in embryos in which cells learn what they should become is through what is called a morphogen gradient. Morphogen, I don't need to tell you, David, comes from the Greek, morpho for shape, gen for generating, I suppose. I, I quickly gloss over that. Um, but the idea is that in an embryo, you have a source of a signal, a source of a molecule locally, 
And that signal then diffuses away from that source. So imagine in that French flag in the middle that there's a chemical made in the flagpole and that chemical then diffuses away along that flag such that where the concentration of that chemical is high, cells turn blue. Where it's lower, they turn white. And where it's lower still, they turn red. So cells can measure the concentration of a substance, which we're calling a morphogen. Does this happen? It does. So in my PhD work, I was working on the development of the limb, of the chicken limb. And in this slide, you can see on the left, a normal chicken egg, but a fertilized chicken egg that has been incubated for three days. And you can see if you take off the eggshell at the top there, and look at the yolk, you can see sitting on top of that yolk, what I regard as a beautiful three-day embryo. So you can see the blood vessels here collecting the nutrients from the yolk, the blood vessels going into the embryo, which is this little comma-shaped thing here, feeding the embryo. And this here in the middle is a drawing of that embryo, highlighting the wing buds. So the wings of the chicken form from these little lumps on the side of the embryo. So you can see them there at three days as little lumps. By 10 days, they're pretty recognizable limbs. And you can stain those limbs with a particular stain to show the bones. And in here, I don't know if you can see me as well, but you've got the forearm here and the radius and the ulna. And chickens have three fingers that we call digits two, three, and four. So the question is, how do those digits form in the right place? How does digit four form at the back side, digit three in the middle, and digit two towards the front? And the answer is it works according to these morphogen gradients I've spoken about. And in this limb bud, so this is now at a slightly later stage, it's the limb bud drawn on its own, and you see that I've hatched an area here. And it proves that that hatched area is the source of this morphogen that I mentioned. So the model would have it, and I'm sure you can see this already, that as the substance moves away from that source, where the concentration is high, you would make a digit four. Where it's lower, you'd make a digit three. And where it's lower still, you'd make a digit two. So the prediction would be that if you took that area from one embryo and grafted it into another, like this, which you can do, I should give you a sense of scale. This is about a millimeter from top to bottom. The graft is about a tenth of a millimeter. So it's you know small, small. But if you do that, then what you get when you get the limb in the end is a mirror image duplicated limb. Can you see that? So now the concentration is high here and here. So you get a four at the top and the bottom. Then it gets lower and then it gets lower. So this tells us that there is a signal that those cells are making that is interpreted by the cells in the limb bud to form particular fingers. And then you can see that if you did the graft rather than to that position I showed you up at the top, but to the tip of the limb bud like this, then you've got it the four near the source, three. It never gets low enough to form a two. So you get another digit four then a four on the other side and a three and a two. I hope that's clear. And what it says to me is that this limb bud responds to a graded signal produced by these cells at the posterior, the back region of the limb bud. And my PhD work, one of the things we did was to say, well, maybe another way of showing this is if we could take that region at the top and weaken it in some way. Is it possible to weaken it? And I did find that you could weaken it using various um, uh, physical x-ray insults. For example, if you take them, you radiate them. So if you take a, a normal one of these regions, you get four, three, two, two, three, four. But if you weaken the signal with increasing doses of radiation, then you just get a three, a two, a two, three, four, then just a two, and then nothing. So what this says is that there is a graded signal produced by these cells that specifies the finger that forms. 
Now, I did this work in the late 70s, and things have advanced since then, and we now know what that molecule is. I'm not going to tell you much about it now, but we do know what it is. And this is a technique that allows you to visualize where that signal is made in that limb bud, and you can see that it's expressed just here, exactly where you'd expect it to be expressed. And the name of the molecule is called sonic hedgehog. And if you're looking, if you're struggling at the end to think of a question to ask me because you didn't understand a word I said, ask me why it's called sonic hedgehog and I will tell you the answer. So that's what I did on limb development. And as, as one way of just making sure we're all on the same page, I'm going to ask you a question. It's just to, it, you know, it's a sort of uh, teacher's technique, if you like. And here's the question. What I've shown you is that effectively you're creating a coordinate system within the limb such that cells in the limb bud know where they are. If you're towards the back, you know you're a particular sort of finger. If you're at the top, you're a different sort of finger. Similarly, along the long axis, you know if you're at the tip of the, of the long axis, you'll form a finger, but if you're at the base, you'll form a shoulder. So this is the question, and I'd be interested to know what you think about the answer. That's a leg bud at the top, and that's a wing bud at the bottom. This is the test. Suppose I take from that leg bud a block of tissue that would normally have formed thigh. And if I take it out and I graft it to a wing bud in a position that would normally form finger, what would it form? Now, I have to tell you that if you're, if you're leg tissue by this time, you remember that you're leg tissue. So you've got leg tissue, originally thigh, move it to the part of the wing that would form a finger. This is my big test. If you get this right, then I'm going to be pleased. So how do I go on to gallery view? I'm going to turn off sharing, go to gallery view, go to full screen with a bit of luck. So I hope I've explained what, what I wanted to say, that you take prospective thigh, graft it to a wing bud at the tip where it would make a finger. So hands up, those who think that that piece of tissue should make um, thigh. I see no hands. Hands up those who, ah, I see one hand. Actually, you can just put your hand up physically. Uh, hands up who think it would make, um, Humerus, the upper arm. Nah. Hands up those who think it will make a finger. Who thinks it will make a toe? And it would make a toe because it remembers that it's leg, but it's in the position of the distal part, the, the far reaching parts of a limb. So it thinks it should make a, a toe. And that's the answer to the question. So let's go back to my slides and you'll see just that. It makes toes. So that's the first thing I want to tell you about. Make sure we're not overrunning, which we're not. And now I'm going to move on to a later stage in my career where this same principle applies. But I just want to you know, emphasize to you the importance of this model. It is that cells in the embryo learn what they should become because they can measure the concentration of a factor produced by local, a local region that diffuses away. Does it happen in any other part of embryonic development? I'm gonna let somebody in. And the answer I like to think is yes. So I'm, here we go. And now what I want to do is to show you some experiments with a frog. So this is the middle of my career and this is the South African claw-toed frog, Xenopus levis. There may be some people who will tell you it's a toad, but it's not. It's the claw, T-O-E-D, toad frog. And the next slide just shows you the beauty of embryonic development, because I'm going to show you some frog embryos dividing. And this will be reminiscent, I think, of what you saw at the beginning of, the, of those human embryos. So these are frog embryos. See them divide, 
see the symmetry with which they divide, see the synchrony with which they divide. And the great thing about these embryos as they divide is that I can, if I want to, mark particular cells and I can tell you what they will become. So those cells at the top, I can tell you, will become skin. Those cells on the underside, I can tell you, will become gut. And those cells in the equator, as it were, between the tropics of Capricorn and Cancer, they will form muscle, a layer of cells in the embryo, in fact, that is called the, the, the mesoderm. And again, you know, David, you can see mesoderm middle layer. So this is a very interesting stage if you're an embryo. And what I want you to imagine now is taking one of those embryos, lifting it out and turning it through 90 degrees so that that dark bit there is turned upwards. So just twist it through 90 degrees. And that's what you've got on the left hand side of the screen. Those red cells are the cells at the top and the blue cells are the cells at the bottom. The red cells at the top, the very top, will become skin. The ones at the bottom will become gut. And the ones in between, what I'm calling the mesoderm, will become muscle. Now, it turns out, and this is really interesting, I think, that although I know, and now you know, that those cells in yellow, the mesoderm cells, will form muscle, the embryo at an early stage does not know that because if you take those prospective mesoderm cells out of the embryo and grow them on their own, they'll make skin. So early, and that's why I've rendered them blue, uh, red in the first slide. So there must be something that happens during development that results in those equatorial red cells turning yellow. And you'll know by now then that the likelihood is that it's through a signaling process. And sure enough, if you were to take one of those embryos that you'd labeled through some means green, prospective skin cells, juxtapose those prospective skin cells with gut cells and leave them for a bit, then you'll find that those green cells do not form skin, but they form muscle. So, and that's what you can see in that image in the middle. So this is another example of a signaling event in which cells in the embryo influence the behavior of nearby cells. And I'm gonna go on in a minute, of course, to tell you that it's concentration dependent as well. So I, uh, my scientific claim to fame came because I worked out what those signals were. And um, it proves to be several members of a family of which the most prominent is a molecule called activin. So activin then is made by those cells at the bottom and diffuses up and causes the cells in the middle to become muscle. But you will say, I hope, if activin is made by those bottom cells, why don't they become muscle? And the answer is that those cells are like that blue stripe in the French flag. There's too much activin there for them to become muscle, and it requires a lower concentration for them to become muscle. And that's what I'm going to show you now. So this is now a the same view, a section of such an embryo. At the, these cells down here, these are the, the gut forming cells that make the stuff. These cells at the top are the skin cells. And what I've done is stain this embryo with a particular marker that marks the mesoderm, that marks those cells that will become muscle. Uh, again, for the classical scholars, uh, the gene is called brachyuri, which is Greek for short tail. And it turns out that there's a mutation in the mouse in which the tail is short and that they lack this gene. So here's the experiment. And um, this I hope will be clear. What we do is we take those skin cells, we dissect them into a single cell suspension. So we take the cells from the top. This, this is about, this area is about uh, 0.2 of a millimeter or something. So we take, take these out, dissect them into single cells, treat the different concentrations of activin and ask whether we see the expression of that gene, of that 
Jean Brackenbury? And the answer is, as I'd hoped, that where the concentration of Brachyuri is low, so just look here, this tells you whether the gene is activated or not. Where the concentration is low, like at the top of the embryo, no expression. Where it's really high, like at the bottom of the embryo, no expression. But in the middle, it's expressed. And this is the clearest expression, the clearest demonstration, I think there has been, for this principle of the French flag, for the principle that a single molecule can act at different concentrations to make cells become different things. Skin at low concentrations, muscle at intermediate concentrations, and gut at high concentrations. And I did this work, I should add, with Jeremy Green, um, who is a Latimerian, who worked with me for some four or five years and is now Professor of Developmental Biology at King's College London. And I always acknowledge Jeremy because we had a great time doing these experiments and um, he was, you know, stalwart in his support of this stuff because it was, these, these were tricky experiments and he did a fantastic job. So the message I want you to take from this is, is now we know confirmed with a direct experiment that different concentrations of a molecule can cause cells to form particular cell types. And I'm now going to give you one more little story that brings you up to date. Why is this important? Why are these molecules important? And in particular, why are these active in molecules so important? And it turns out that they are really important in the area of what we call regenerative medicine. That is to say, making cells in a dish that can um, replace cells that have been lost or you know, damaged in some way, perhaps through a heart attack. And I'm thinking here particularly about heart attacks. You'll see that um, deaths in the uh, first decade of the 21st century, 30% of deaths came through, through various sorts of cardiovascular, cardiovascular diseases. Frequently, these are of course heart attacks, where a block in an artery leads to a reduction in blood flow to the heart and the, the death of, those, of, of cells in the heart that compromises, of course, the function of the heart. So the question is, can we use lessons from developmental biology, what I've been talking about, to replace damaged heart muscle tissue? Can we, in other words, build on everything that I've been describing to you? Stories about the concentration of the factors and the identity of the factors. Can we use that now for good? So we've turned to look at heart development, and I'm not going to go into any detail about heart development, but what we've done is explored it carefully in the mouse and identified through looking at early embryos, and you can see an early mouse embryo with its heart beating there. Underneath, you can see little dissected pieces of hearts. And we've used these hearts as a way to understand the, the signals and the molecules that pass between cells and cause them to become heart muscle. With that knowledge in hand, knowing what happens in the normal embryo, what we've then been able to do is take stem cells. And we can, there are two sorts of stem cell we can use. One is the sort of stem cell that I referred to right at the start when I was speaking about those embryos and drawing your attention to that little group of cells at the bottom of the cavity. Those were the inner cell mass cells that make the human being. And one can take those cells out of an embryo, grow them in a dish. Alternatively, you can take cells out of me, the adult, treat them with various molecules and cause them to go backwards in developmental time to become stem cells. So there are two ways of making stem cells. And once you have those stem cells, you can pretend they're embryo cells and drive them down particular developmental pathways. You can cause them to form the molecules you want them to form as long as you know what happened in the embryo, as long as you can recapitulate those events you saw in the embryo. So we can do that. 
we can take HPSCs, human pluripotent stem cells, day zero, and we can then treat them with these factors that I've been describing to you. Active in, there's one called derriere, then there's another family of molecules called the wince. Retinoic acid plays a role as well, and another molecule called fibroblast growth factor. It doesn't matter too much what they are, but we know the concentrations and we know the order in which we have to apply them to these cells to bring those cells from this very early stage into becoming heart muscle. But that's illustrated schematically there. And what you see here are some cells in a dish that we've begun this process with six days into the process. And if you look at these cells, you can see that they're just beginning to think about beating. Can you see there's some sort of uh, vibration going on there? They're just beginning to think, speaking to each other, let's start to beat. And then if you go to a later stage at 10 days, then you really will be able to see it. So these cells, these are heart muscle cells. These are beginning to recognize that their heart, they beat. And these are the cells that we think eventually we'll be able to use in replacement therapies. I like that movie at 10 days, particularly because it shows the synchrony of the cells. These cells aren't, aren't you know, contracting individually, they're contracting as a group. And it turns out that they do that because they are electrically coupled. So this is, this, this is perhaps going a little bit beyond where we need to be, but this is a beautiful experiment. This black rectangle has got lots of little white spots in it. And each of those spots is a mini electrode. And you can seed on this black rectangle, which is of course tiny, cells. And then you can stimulate one of those cells electrically. And then you can watch over that field of cells, the cells communicating each other and the electrical coupling spreading across the field of cells, causing those cells to beat in a synchronous fashion. So I'll just show you that. So bang, we've set things off and you can see the waves spreading across the cells as this electrical coupling causes the cells to beat in synchrony. Fantastic. So where, so where have we got to now? I'm really pleased because we've got to a place where we can now take human embryonic stem cells and we can not only make them make heart muscle, but we can make them make heart muscle characteristic of the left ventricle. And it's those cells that are damaged after heart attack. We need to mature the cells a little more than they are currently. We need to, to see how well they work in, in rabbits. We need to make them in the right way to use them in human beings. We need to do some large animal studies. But I think as a way of going from embryos and our understanding through pluripotent stem cells to heart muscle, I'm pleased that by the, you know, the end of my career, We've gone from this problem that we didn't really understand what was going on, a problem where, frankly, I was only interested in it because I was interested in the process. I had no clue that it would, that it would eventually lead to something practical. But over that time, we've come to a place where with a bit of luck, we'll be able to help people who have had heart attacks. And I say at the bottom there, Andrea Bernardo, and Andrea has been doing this work with me and doing a terrific job. So. That's my life in developmental biology, if you like. I hope I've illustrated some of the principles of how embryos develop. That concentration stuff I do think is important and interesting. There's still a lot to learn. And I want to emphasize the way in which fundamental discovery science, knowledge for its own sake, leads into practical applications. And this is where the work was done, Francis Crick Institute, new building, beautiful building just by St Pancras, that's St Pancras bottom left, and those of you who know your libraries will recognise that as the British Library. So how have I done here? Not bad, 43. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen, I'm going to thank you again for listening, and we'll see if there's any questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, if you want to either raise your hand um, or just make yourself known in the chat bar, then I can kind of call on, on people for questions. Uh, Taylor, do you want to start? 
if you, if you just unmute yourself, please. Hello. Taylor, good to see you, as always. Absolutely fascinating. I think I followed most of it. I certainly followed some of it. So <laughs> thank you very, very much. And I've learned a, a, a great deal on a, on, on a process that's clearly so fundamental that, that I feel I should know more about. So thank you very much for that. My question is really relating to right what you were saying at the very end there. You're still talking about the use of stem cells as something that will happen in the future. Uh, or, the, or the value of reimplanting stem cells to restore and improve damaged tissue. How near do you think is that? It, it, are we talking about years? Are we talking about decades? You know, how near is this fantastic solution that it's, you're yeah. central in developing? Thank it's you. very near, Taylor. I mean, I, I was speaking about my own work there particularly, but it's really close in, for example, in areas like skin, where you can graft onto burns. Uh, it's used for, for example, cancer treatments. It's, it's there. I was, I was um, speaking about my own work just because I'm so self-centered, but it's, it's something that's used widely and it really is, um, you know, transformational is an overused word, but it really is making a fantastic difference already. Well, congratulations for being at the center of that development. Well done. Well, to some extent. Thank you. <laughs> Nancy, it's nice to see you. I can just see you there. Hi. We've got a question from uh, Lucas Black. Hi. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. I can. Excellent. Uh, so thank you for the amazing talk. Uh, it's good to hear sort of a really concise um, background of pretty much the last 30 years of development of biology. Um, it's, I was just really wondering, um, these technologies that your your work is sort of founded, um, are they going to be able to be applied to many other diseases, particularly neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, where it's not a mechanical fault that's going on, but much more complex uh, disease characteristics? Yeah, Lucas, and I think, Lucas, the answer is yes. I mean, just let me make a, a disclaimer, which is that there are lots of people working on this, you know, and you know, I spoke about my own work, but let's let's be clear, this is a huge field with a large number of highly talented people working in it, achieving great things. So that's really important to say. Um, and I think the answer to your question is a, is a yes, that um, this ability to create cells of a desired type and use them to replace diseased or malfunctioning cells in the adult is one that is going to be widely used. You describe the, the heart thing as almost a mechanical matter, which it is, of course, although it's more than mechanical because it requires you know, the synchrony of the heart beating and so on. But I'm sure that it will be, be used in Parkinson's and in an, and many, many other diseases as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, John, I see John, Paul and Sophie. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Hi, yeah, I've managed to unmute us. Um, yeah, we were wondering, uh, thank you so much for the talk, by the way, Jim. It was really, really interesting. Um, I was just wondering um, if uh, this could theoretically help babies who had, uh, sorry, fetuses who had congenital heart conditions um in the future um you have these 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 discussions are always complicated because um you know there are ethical issues that begin to surround them as well so i'm going to put those ethical issues to one side for a second and just say is it is it theoretically possible and i think the answer to that is is yes it is theoretically possible whether it will be done is another question, but it's certainly theoretically possible. Thank you. Whether it should be done is another question. Thank you. Would anyone else like to ask a question? Mark Bullimore. Hey Jim, great talk. And uh, always uh, interested to see a fellow scientist and uh, at the top of their game. So uh, thank you for sharing. Um, my, actual, my question was about Jeremy Green. Um, 
I think he was in my class at Latimer. It's, oh, really? It's like, same Jeremy Green. Um, he had a and, he has a brother called Danny. Is that the one? Um, don't know, but I, I I think I was just you know through the power of Google. I was is he at King's College now? That's him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it. I think he was in my class to him, and uh, I don't know what Chris Hammond uh, taught him, uh, but he had a. He was one of the bigger brains I rubbed up against at uh, Latimer, <laughs> so it wouldn't surprise me. And uh, uh, so Jeremy's doing some brilliant stuff now. Actually, he's doing a combination of. Uh, developmental biology and mathematical modeling that's been just fantastic um i heartily recommend it no that's one's asked me about sonic hedgehog yet by the way not that i'm well, not that i'm, I'm fishing was, I was for questions. that to the end okay. um, <laughs> I, uh, roger's got a question for us that i think we all we all want to know the answer to roger do you want to ask yeah yeah um it's very simple jim i mean if if you can regenerate a heart and possibly bits of my brain and keep my guts going, you know, with too much wine. Is is there a finite absorption capacity of my existing body to, to just keep regenerating forever? That's a good question, Roger. Um, the thing about cells is that they have a life. They have a lifespan. And uh, Hayflick, Mark will have heard of Hayflick. Hayflick had a limit of, that cells can divide 70 times. And this is because one of the things is the chromosomes in your body have got structures at their end. I'm just looking for a pair of shoes. I've got structures at their end, like those sort of things you have at the end of laces. Do you know what I mean? And when cells divide, those, those little ferrules over there get shorter and shorter and shorter. And as they get vanishingly short, the cells senesce and die. So cells themselves, except for, except for sperm and egg cells, have a scientific, have a, have a lifetime, I regret to say. So I don't think, Roger, I can keep you alive forever, but you're looking pretty good. <laughs> That's sweet, thank you. And uh, we've got a question from Chloe. Chloe, do you wanna unmute yourself? Hi, Jim. Um, yeah, I was going to take the bait and ask about Sonic the Hedgehog, but also a second point. What happened to Chicken Digit 1? Ah, ah, I could have planted the question, Chloe. Thank you. Um, Sonic Hedgehog. So the thing about scientists is they, we think we have a sense of humour, and it's a terrible thing to think you have a sense of humour. So the thing I was emphasising earlier on about the same developmental mechanisms. There was a brilliant series of experiments done in the late 70s, early 80s by uh, Christian de Slein volhard and Eric Bischaus, who did a screen searching for genes in the fruit fly embryo that disrupted development. And um, they found many. And part of the way of, you know, applying a little bit of interest to their work, they they named them in particular ways. And um, one of the genes resulted in the larva having many, many bristles. And so they called it slightly unimaginatively, you might think, hedgehog. There are all sorts of other names as well, but hedgehog was the name. And um, from that point on, scientists, there was a bit of an industry of identifying those genes, working out what they were, and then even more of an industry, asking whether the same genes were also present in human embryos and vertebrate embryos. And it proved, of course, that they are. So when people found the hedgehog genes in um, vertebrates, and people did it in chickens and mice and zebrafish, it turned out that there were three very, very similar genes, all similar enough to the, the fruit fly hedgehog to be called hedgehog, but they had to be distinguished in some way or another. And such is the, the, um, the sense of humor of the developmental biologists that they called one of them Sonic Hedgehog, one of them Indian Hedgehog, and the other one, I think it was Desert Hedgehog. So um, it happened to be Sonic Hedgehog that's present in these embryos and, and it's called Sonic for short. 
where did digit one go? You might ask, where did digit five go? Evolution, Chloe, evolution. They were just lost through evolution. If you look carefully at a chicken limb at 10 days, you'll see a tiny bit of cartilage where we think digit five was. But digit one has just been lost, I'm afraid. And I'm speaking to Chloe Hall, aren't I? Because I can't see you. Yes, you are. Hello, <laughs> Chloe. How are you? Very well, thank you. So Roger's here. You'll know Roger. You know, Ian will know Roger. Anyway, another <laughs> time. We've got another question from Ron. Ron, do you want to unmute yourself, please? Ah. Hi, Jim. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your talk this evening. Absolutely fascinating. I just wonder whether in your work as uh, in developmental biology, whether you've ever encountered any resistance at any stage from animal rights activists as a result of engaging in research on using animals. That's a good question, Ron. And I've, I personally have been very fortunate not to have been um, targeted. And the reason is that the institutes I've worked in and run, what we've tried to do is to be as open as we possibly can to people, to tell people what we're doing. And um, if you do that, and if you explain what you're doing and why you're doing it, I, I think we have been fortunate that openness has served us well. There was one occasion when I worked at the National Institute for Medical Research, where we did have some trouble, where we were, where animal rights activists were present quite a lot. But on the whole, I've been lucky. And I think the, the message is you have to be open and honest, tell people why, why you're doing things, invite them into the Institute, show them the animals. And I find that works quite well, actually. Certainly that's the approach we adopt at the Crick. And that's been very successful. Well, I'm, I'm delighted that that is the case. I mean, going back to uh, the 1980s, I worked with Professor Roy Khan in, in Cambridge as a police yeah. officer when he was extensively targeted both at work and at home uh, and had his home attacked as well as uh, yeah. his experimental research facility. Yeah. Yeah. No, we were lucky, probably. Good. Good, glad to hear that. Uh, we've got a question from Laura. Ah. Oh, hello, hi. Um, hello, very well, thanks. Um, in rural North Devon, thank you very much for your talk. Andy Doughty put me onto it, so, um, but thank you very much. Um, I don't quite understand how the heart muscles um, sort of get to the dead part of the heart. I'm a, I'm a GP, so. Mm -hmm know very little about a lot but anyway so could you use a vaccine to induce the muscle regeneration so that you the vaccine has um the the message uh, of the activin or whatever you're so that's so not a vaccine but i think the techniques that we're using at the moment to deliver vaccines particularly the rna vaccines that you may have heard about for covid19 it's possible. I mean, this is, here we're talking theory, but you can imagine, and, you know, people say, oh, you know, five years time, we're talking 50 years time, I suspect. You can imagine using vaccine technology of the sort that's used for the, um, the two RNA vaccines to introduce RNA into cells with a bit of luck, take them back through developmental time, and then or turn, then use other agents to bring them forward in developmental time. That could be one way of doing it, but I think that is probably an over-engineered approach, and I would be more inclined to use the kind of approach that we're thinking about, but of course I would say that, wouldn't I? But, but I, think, I think it will be complicated. <laughs> Thank you very much, though. Thank you. Okay, that sounds great. Um, any um, any final questions for Jim before we wrap up? No. Okay. Well, 
Listen, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Jim. It was absolutely fascinating to hear um, the remarkable journey that we've uh, taken to become who we are. Um, <laughs> Jim has been so generous with his time and we're so appreciative appreciative that he's taken the time to support our bursary program yet again tonight. Thank you to our audience for your great questions. Um, if you'd like to see more of the virtually speaking talks, you'll see a link um, to, on, in the chat bar now to our forthcoming events page. Uh, you can register for the festive evening of musicals and jazz, which will be the last in the series before Chris the Christmas break. You'll also see a link for the donations and our video library for all of our previous virtually speaking talks. Sadly, this brings us to the end of our evening together. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you to Jim for a brilliant evening and we hope to see you all again very soon. Good night.